Okay, thank you for logging in and thank you for looking at this video. Um, what I want to do is just spend a few moments looking at Harold Wilson as a person. As we go through A-level modern British history, we encounter a number of different politicians. And I think particularly when we look at leaders, we learn quite a bit about their government and about their approach to leadership. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at Harold Wilson, particularly as he takes over at number 10 Downing Street in 1964. And I'm going to break this down into three key areas for us. I'm going to start by looking at his background. I'm then going to move on to his political ideology. And then finally, I'm going to look at his style of leadership. Now, this is going to be a really brief overview. We're not going into any depth at all. This is not a 30 minute documentary. This is literally just a few moments. So if you really want to have a chance of understanding Harold Wilson any deeper, it's upon you to do that wider reading, to do that wider research after we've got a basic idea of him now. So let's start on his background. Harold Wilson's background is different to the previous Prime Ministers, certainly the last four Conservative Prime Ministers. So we've had Churchill, Anthony Eden, Harold Macmillan and Alec Douglas Hume. All of those are what you could describe as very traditional in their background. They all went to renowned, expensive public schools and then, apart from Churchill, went to Oxford. Churchill goes on to Sanders to the military academy to start his military career. So Churchill goes to Harrow and then Sanders. Eden goes to Eton and then Oxford. Macmillan, Eton, Oxford, Douglas Hume. It's, you can see where this is going. Eton and Oxford. So all of those have had what is described as a typical Edwardian education. Harold Wilson is different. Harold Wilson goes to a grammar school in North Yorkshire. He gets there on a scholarship and therefore it is not a public education. It is very different. It's state education pretty much. And then he goes to Oxford. So there is a bit of similarity at that point but up until there it's different. And if we have a look at their families as well we see a difference as well. Churchill, Eden, Macmillan and Douglas Hume are all pretty much connected to the aristocracy. Douglas Hume is a member of the aristocracy, but they're all landed gentry and all have connections within that network. Harold Wilson is very different. His father's a chemist. His mum is a teacher. They're very middle class. I'm not suggesting that they're working class. I'm not suggesting they're living in poverty, but they're certainly not the same as the Prime Ministers that have gone before them. So from your perspective, how do you think that would play out to the electorate, to those that are going to vote in 1964? Is that going to be a better connection for them? Are they going to see Harold Wilson as one of us? Or are they going to see Harold Wilson as one of them? one of the aristocracy. That's a factor you need to consider when you're looking at why do Labour win the 1964 general election? Harold Wilson's background is a factor. And he knows that. He plays on that to his advantage. Harold Wilson gives a speech in 1962 to Daily Express newspaper. And I'm going to read what he says to you. Just this little quote from it. And he says, the right wing establishment has never tried to embrace me or buy me off. That's probably a compliment. Lady Watsit or Lord so-and-so haven't plied me with invitations. I don't do much socialising. My tastes are simple. If I had the choice between smoked salmon and tinned salmon, I'd have it tinned with vinegar. I prefer beer to champagne. And if I get the chance to go home, I have a North Country high tea without wine. So think about the audience there. Who's he speaking to? This is 1962. He knows an election's going to be coming up and he's making sure now he's connecting with voters. There's these lines here that he's using. If I had the choice between smoked salmon and tinned salmon, I'd have it tinned. Clearly that's what most people would have had at that time. Tinned salmon. I prefer beer to champagne. 
So Harold Wilson is certainly playing on this difference to his advantage. Now it's worth saying though that in reality, Harold Wilson was slightly different than what he's portraying. If you look at photographs of Harold Wilson, you'll quite often see him smoking a pipe. Truth, Harold Wilson didn't like smoking a pipe. He preferred smoking cigars. But a cigar does clearly got connotations and connections straight away with Winston Churchill. But also it gives this idea of businessman, of affluence, of wealth. Harold Wilson doesn't want to portray that, hence he's seen with a pipe. That's more working class as far as he's concerned and connects with the people. Similarly, the coat that Harold Wilson wears when he's photographed quite a lot. It's a very fashionable coat, the Ganex coat. He made it at that time. And he's trying to make that connection with people. I'm fashionable. I'm one of you. I'm not one of them. And if you look further into the 60s, you'll see photographs with Harold Wilson with the great and the good of that time, the famous, the Beatles, people like that. Harold Wilson makes sure he plays on that connection all the time. And so background is something that you need to think about when you're looking at Harold Wilson and what type of prime minister he is. So with background looked at, I now want to start looking at his ideology, his political beliefs and his political views. Now looking at ideology, Wilson really stakes himself out to be on the left of the Labour Party early on in his political career. Some people describe the Labour Party as being on the left and sometimes on the right. I don't really sign up to that. I see the Labour Party as being on the left or you've got a more centrist approach. But to describe the Labour Party as being on the right to me seems slightly at odds with me. So I'm going to describe Harold Wilson at this point as being on the left of the Labour Party. Now, evidence of that, if we need to talk about that further, is in 1951, when Bevan resigns because of the NHS prescription charges, charges for spectacles, false teeth and wigs. The other minister who goes with him at that time is Harold Wilson. Now, it's argued that at that point, Harold Wilson is a nobody. Hugh Dalton, who'd been the Chancellor um, during Attlee's government, gives a scathing um, comment about Wilson at that point, And it's how he describes him. And it's worth, again, I'll look at it. It's worth reading this out. And Dalton describes Wilson as not a great success. He's a weak and conceited minister. He has no public face. He's said to be frantically ambitious and desperately jealous of Gateskill. Gateskill is the up and coming star of the Labour Party at that time. He's going to take over as leader of the Labour Party. And clearly there's this identification here that Wilson's envious of Gateskill. We'll have a look at that in a couple of moments again in a little bit more detail. But as you'll see, the image that you've now got, in, that you've seen, you've got the Daily Express headline that talks about Bevan resigning but Wilson's managed to get himself on the front page as well. His resignation features there as well. So I'm going to put the question to you at this point. Has Wilson resigned genuinely on his beliefs or has Wilson resigned because he sees an opportunity of raising his profile? I'm not saying either way. That's for you to describe. That's for you to decide. And you need to look at that wider picture to really consider what kind of a political animal Harold Wilson is. Now, accepting Harold Wilson resigned in 1951 as a minister, he's not resigned from government, he's not resigned as an MP, he's resigned as a minister. But he then becomes a member of the Shadow Cabinet under Gateskill. In theory, the person he doesn't like, the person he really wants to take over from, he works in his Shadow Cabinet. He's Shadow Chancellor and Shadow Foreign Secretary. And in 1961, he actually goes against Gateskill for leadership of the Labour Party, but loses. So we can see that Wilson's really got political ambitions, but he's willing to work with people. He's willing to manoeuvre. Is that for his advantage or is he seeing it for the good of the Labour Party? Again, that's something you've got to decide. Following Gateskill's death, Wilson does take over. As leader of the Labour Party. 
Now, we've seen the quote, or rather I've talked through the quote that Harold Wilson gave in the interview about the tin salmon and preferring beer to champagne, how he's connecting with people. However, he also gives an interesting speech, 1964, Birmingham Town Hall. And I want to read some of that out to you. And he says here, I want to speak to you today about a new Britain. For 1964 is the year in which we can take our destiny into our own hands. A chance for change. A chance to sweep away the grouse more conception of Tory leadership and refit Britain with a new image, a new confidence. So Wilson's now really playing his political hand here. He's saying that I'm a person of change. I'm going to move forwards. So is this a change from the far left of the Labour Party? Are we seeing that he's signalling he's going to go more centrist? Are we seeing something else? Are we seeing this is a change from the establishment, a chance to sweep away the grouse more conception of Tory leadership? I'd suggest to you it's both. He's saying to the electorate, the people that will vote, do not associate me with the establishment. But I'd also suggest now he's sending a message internally within his own party. There will be a change. We have to change if we're going to win the election. It's something for you to consider if you're writing about Harold Wilson in the future. And then finally, when we're looking at his ideology, this idea that he can shift his position is really well shown in his speech at the Labour Party conference in 1963. It's one of Wilson's most famous speeches. It's known as the white heat of technology speech. And again, I'm just going to refer to part of that for you. And it's the Britain that is going to be forged in the white heat of this revolution will be no place for restrictive practices or for outdated methods on either side of industry. In the cabinet room and the boardroom alike, those charged with the control of our affairs must be ready to think and to speak with the language of our scientific age. That message, this is what he's saying here. No place for restrictive practices or outdated methods. This isn't just talking about scientific technology. This isn't just talking about the space race. This is a message to the unions. You have to change your practices. You have to modernise. Wilson's almost signalling here he's willing to challenge the unions head on. So look at that in the round. 1951, we saw somebody who resigned with Bevan when the issue of NHS prescription charges came in. But by the time we get to 1963, he's clearly shifted. He's moved from a far left position to a more centrist position. He's now talking about challenging the unions. And therefore, if we're looking at his ideology, I would suggest it changes, it moves. The reason behind that is something you've got to decide. Is it for Howard Wilson's own gain? Is he doing this so he can get into number 10? Or is he doing it because he genuinely believes it's the right thing to do? You need to look at the evidence and construct your argument. So we've looked at his background. We've looked at his ideology. And now I want to look at his leadership when he finally does get into number 10. So Harold Wilson's leadership style when he gets to number 10, I would suggest is quite unusual. Generally, a prime minister would have their cabinet, their most senior and key government ministers. That would be made up in Harold Wilson's time of generally about 25 ministers. The government would be a wider range of ministers but your key appointments, things like Foreign Office, Defence, Home Office, Chancellor, others, Trade, about 25 ministers. And that's who Harold Wilson would go to for advice, for their opinion, before he makes decisions. However, Harold Wilson has an even closer circle of people that he trusts, that he shares his views with, and it's not his cabinet. Some of these aren't even elected officials. His personal secretary, Marcia Williams, is part of this intimate circle. And it becomes known as the kitchen cabinet. Pretty much because it's described as meeting in the kitchen of number 10 Downing Street. 
And therefore, a lot of ministers, a lot of cabinet ministers are pushed out. Is Wilson doing this to keep as much information as possible to himself? Is he doing this because he doesn't trust this cabinet? Only you can really decide that by looking at that evidence and making a balanced and analytical decision on this kind of leader that Harold Wilson is. So that's a very broad overview of Harold Wilson. It's really now down to you to do that further reading, to have a look at what else you can find out about him and inform yourself as to the kind of Prime Minister he is and then compare him with others. Don't forget, at A level, we're not just going to be looking at things in the singular. We've got to make those connections across different periods, different events, different Prime Ministers. So look at Wilson and then compare him with previous Prime Ministers and be prepared to compare Wilson against Prime Ministers that are going to come next down the line. So there we go. That's how it works. Very, very good. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.